Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really a privilege to be here, um, and a particular pleasure to be here uh, in Dublin's fair city, as the song has it, um, to celebrate digital creativity and Creative Commons Ireland. Uh, Creative Commons has a very special place in my personal and professional affections. Um, my story begins, and Christina and I did not plan this, but I had actually written this out already. Uh, my story begins long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Uh, actually, it was 1995, and it was in California. Uh, 1995 really is a long time ago uh, in Internet time. Uh, you know, no Google, no F YouTube, no Facebook, no eBay, no Creative Commons, no Wikipedia, no Amazon, none of that. Uh, the Internet in 1995 was a very new thing to very many people, um, if they knew about it at all. Uh, I gave a talk in 1995 about cyberspace law at a law school in the United States, and at the end of which one of the faculty members, a uh, fairly distinguished uh, gentleman, older gentleman, uh, came up and said, I thought you were talking about outer space. Um, the internet, of course, had been around for 15 years or so uh, at this point, but it really wasn't until 1993, 1994, um, with the release of the first web browsers, uh, that it truly exploded into, into people's consciousness uh, or, across the globe. So that's the long ago, long, long ago part. The far, far, the galaxy far, far away part is California is a galaxy far, far away. Even when you're in California, it feels like California is a galaxy far, far away. Um, we presented, my colleague David and Johnson and I presented a paper that uh, Darius mentioned actually um, at the Stanford Law School Symposium on Law and Borders. Um, we said this, this problem, the problem of law and borders, is going to prove particularly challenging for the development of law on the internet. Um, the borders problem, uh, the problem being that on this then new global network, uh, it's very difficult, it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult to reconstruct or identify those borders, the Irish border, the United States border, um, the border between Tanzania and Kenya, or Argentina and Brazil. Um, uh, difficult to identify those borders around which we organize so much of our lives and more to the point, so much of our law in real space. Um, in 1995, we suggested that this borders problem was going to prove very difficult for the international legal system to solve with its existing tools and its existing paradigms. I think we were right about that. Uh, one month ago, I was in Amsterdam at a uh, round table organized by the Dutch Ministry of Information and Security and uh, Tilburg University uh, focused on cross-border internet searches and the legal framework for understanding that. Whose permission do you need if you have authorization from the Dutch police, for example, the Dutch prosecutor, if they have authorization to search someone's email inbox and that email inbox turns out to be distributed somewhere in the cloud. How, who's, where do you go to ask for permission to do that? That was a hard question in 1995, and it is a hard question in 2014. Um, in our paper, uh, David and I suggested that cyberspace could use perhaps some new paradigms, some new ways of conceptualizing law and lawmaking across the network. And perhaps, we said, we should spend less time thinking about how to map or impose those real space borders onto the global network. Um, a global network that drew so much of its power and so much of its potential from the very fact that it was border defying, that it put everybody on the network equidistant from everyone else on the network, uh, irrespective of which side, of which border they were on. A network that seemed to allow messages to appear instantaneously everywhere. Um, less time thinking about mapping the real space borders onto the network and more time thinking about ways that law might emerge out there on the internet as part of the new forms of social organization and social interaction that the internet enabled that were already in 1995 coming into view. Um, and all this was before of course Facebook and Wikipedia and YouTube not to mention the Arab Spring gave us a better idea about what those new forms of social organization might look like and how powerful they could be. Um, emergent forms of law that could perhaps draw strength from the network's global and border-defying reach rather than trying to suppress or contain or disavow that remarkable feature of the network. New kinds of law that might treat the borderless nature and global reach of the network as an opportunity to be seized 
rather than as a problem to be solved. And instead of asking how law gets imposed on the new kinds of communities that were emerging in cyberspace, we wanted to ask how might law emerge from those communities and how might we help it to do so? What kinds of institutions or tools might be needed to help that process along? Now, I think it's fair to say that the reaction of many of our colleagues to these ideas, um, both at the time and in the ensuing years, um, was not always warm, uh, ranging somewhere between sort of shock and horror. Uh, Darius mentioned, to our surprise, if, if our article had been a CD, uh, I'd be up here saying, you know, it went platinum, um, for an academic law review article, at least. Uh, uh, Fred Shapiro, who is the... Uh, uh, a librarian at Yale University Law School uh, wrote an article last year uh, studying citation counts, and lo and behold, this was the most cited article in the field of intellectual property written since 1928. Um, and that's very flattering. It's one, you know, I'm very proud of that, except I know what most people don't know, um, having read many of these citations, that most of the citations we, we get, and there are 12,000 of them or some very large number, most of the citations are of the form, um, some people have really crazy ideas about internet law. C, E, G, Johnson and Post, I mean it. 80% of them are like that. Um, you know, cyber utopianism, people called it, you know, the governments of the world, they said, would never stand for it. Uh, they're going to impose their borders on the network, like it or not, and it was idle dreaming to pretend otherwise. To others, it smacked of a kind of cyber exceptionalism. Don't get so carried away, they said. There's nothing really new about these border problems. No need for radical rethinking of the role of law on the network. Um, these are border crossing events and transactions in the real world all the time. The international system, legal system, has the tools to deal with them, they said. Now, Larry Lessig, um, who I had not met before, was at that conference in 1995. Um, and in fact, he was the designated respondent for our paper, and, and he prepared a response uh, entitled The Zones of Cyberspace. You can find it online um, if you're interested. Uh, he, pre he prepared the response to our article, and, and in preparation for this talk, I reread for the first time in many years um, what, what he had written. Uh, now, he didn't exactly buy what we were talking about, not whole hog at any rate. Um, he wrote that the Johnson Post picture was of a democracy, quote, a democracy in cyberspace a world of cyber citizens deciding on the laws that will apply to them, and a claim that this more perfect democracy deserves respect, unquote. Well, he called that overly romantic. I like that, I, I, I can live with that. Um, more of a, quote, hope built on a picture of cyberspace as it is just now, i.e. in 1995, whereas he remained skeptical uh, firmly skeptical, he said, um, about its prospects because cyberspace would change, he said, regulation in cyberspace would change and as new technologies of regulation and control were developed. Uh, so he didn't buy, exactly buy it, but he didn't think it was crazy either. So fast forward four or five years, 1999, uh, Lessig, of course, during the intervening period has, among many other things, gone off and founded Creative Commons. And we ran into each other at another conference. Um, by this time in 1999, there were internet law conferences springing up all over the place. Uh, the internet had by now been, become a big deal. Uh, the dot-com boom was in full swing. Um, and cyber law conferences were being held all over the place. Um, and he and I start talking. And, and somewhere along the line, he says something like, so uh, what do you think of that Creative Commons? Um, sort of a nice illustration of the Johnson Post law emergence, don't you think? Uh, grassroots, global, bottom-up alternative to an alternative form of regulating the relationship between author and reader and author and reuser. Pretty nice, no? Now, to be honest, I hadn't really thought of that before. Uh, I hadn't made the connection between CC and, and the ideas we had put forth in 1995, but Lessig's a really smart guy. Um, and he often comes up with connections between ideas that have escaped others. And I think he was right. Uh, I think in some ways he understood our ideas better than we understood them. Uh, Creative Commons does represent an important new kind of law, a people taking the law into their own hands kind of law. 
grassroots, global, bottom-up, leveraging the power of contract to restructure those relationships, author, reader, republisher, linker, masher, upper, to make them more congenial to what they think they should be, part of a larger, ill-defined, but very important social movement around the globe with its sister phenomena, the open access movement and the open source software movement. And here we are today, 15 years on, hundreds of millions of CC licenses later. The estimates of how many Creative Commons licenses are out there range from 400 to 800 million, no one knows for sure, but it's a lot. Um, and it is appropriate at this point to stand back sometimes and just admire and applaud the achievement. The astounding growth of Creative Commons and of the movement of which it is a part um, is a remarkable phenomenon that I assure you no one predicted this kind of success back in 1999 or 2000 um, when Lessig kicked this off. And I think people will look back on this in 50 years or 100 years and recognize in it the seeds of important new ways of thinking about the rights of authors and users and of new modes of global law formation. Uh, so I am delighted to be here to help celebrate its continued growth. And as it happens, I think we do rather desperately need some new ways of thinking about the rights of authors, readers, listeners, creators, users, and reusers. Lessig was right about that, too. Um, copyright law, the primary vehicle in the law for the regulation of those relationships, has, I think it's fair to say, run amok in recent years. Uh, I use the term advisedly. I like to believe I am a reasonable man. Uh, I have an open mind about things. Um, I can usually see both sides of arguments as a well-trained lawyer, and I certainly recognize there are many fine points about copyright law about which reasonable people can disagree. But I do not see how one can disagree reasonably with the proposition that copyright law has run amok. Uh, to give you some idea of what I'm talking about, a few weeks ago, the United States Federal Court issued a decision that Sherlock Holmes, or more precisely, the characters and incidents in Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories published before 1923, have finally fallen into the public domain free of copyright restrictions of any kind. Not mind you, anything Arthur Conan Doyle published after 1923. That material remains under copyright for another five years. But the Sherlock Holmes of The Hound of the Baskervilles, 1903, The Valley of Fear, 1915, is now officially free for all. Now, Arthur Conan Doyle was born in 1859. Oh, and my apologies, by the way. There is something unseemly about coming to Ireland and choosing as an example choose of, of an author. If I have to pick an author, why couldn't I have picked an Irish author? But <laughs> at least he's Scottish. And um, it's an actual case. So what, what can I do? I'm stuck with the fact. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle is as distant a figure to the young people in my classrooms, or the young people in this audience for that matter, as, say, Charles Dickens is to me. He comes literally from another age. Sherlock Holmes is as deeply embedded in our shared culture by now as David Copperfield or Oliver Twist, probably more so. Now, I do not have the slightest argument with the notion that Sir Arthur deserved generous financial recompense for his extraordinary acts of creative authorship. And I understand, and indeed I applaud and celebrate, a copyright system that provides for that but that our global copyright system continues to protect these works for the benefit of his great, 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 great <laughs> grandchildren. I worked out the math. Still the possessors of those remaining post-1923 copyrights is, I believe, simply indefensible. It is a transfer of money from those who wish to read about homes to publish book about, books about homes, to make movies about homes, etc., transfer of money to people whose only claim to the entitlement is that they can show dissent from Sir Arthur six generations ago. I don't think one can construct a reasonable argument that explains that or justifies that, whatever theory you may have about copyright law and what its role should be. If your approach to copyright is strictly utilitarian, which is prevalent particularly on my side of the pond, 
Um, if you believe that copyright's purpose is simply and only to secure a fair return to authors as a means of inducing them to create new works for the benefit of all, can one seriously entertain the notion that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle would have worked any less hard or created any less actively knowing that his property would descend only, say, to his great-grandchildren rather than to his And if you tend to more of a natural rights view of copyright, more common on this side of the Atlantic, that copyright rights are moral rights, personal rights, derived ultimately from the work as an extension and embodiment of the author's creative personality, why have we decided that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's personality still requires legal pr protection so long after his death? It's like a ghostly specter haunting our halls, something out of a Sherlock Holmes story, perhaps. This all has a cost, and I think the Creative Commons movement has helped us all to think about that cost and to keep it in the forefront of our minds. It may be true, as Samuel Johnson said, that no man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money, but it is also true that authors like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle don't write just for the money, but his great-great-great-great-grandchildren really are in it just for the money. Um, Sherlock Holmes to them is just an income-generating commodity that by luck of genetic accident they own a piece of. I understand why they like that arrangement and want to prolong it, but why our law should give it substance and credence is beyond me. Now if that were all that was systematically wrong with copyright law today, my claim that it has run amok might seem exaggerated, but it is not all that is wrong with copyright law today. Copyright law not only protects too long, it protects too much, far too much. As most of you know, copyright rights attach immediately upon the creation of any work showing the slightest degree of creative expression. Every email you write, every blog posting or Twitter comment you post, the notes you may be taking now about this talk, the pictures of your children and grandchildren you post on Facebook, every product review you leave, uh, at, a, at a commercial site, every video of stupid pet tricks that you post to YouTube. Copyright protection attaches without any regard whatsoever for whether the author wants protection, whether the author knows about the protection, or has any plans to exploit the protection. Those are entirely irrelevant. It's all protected. As the authors of the modern, modernizing copyright uh, uh, white paper put it, it's a basic and fundamental aspect of copyright today. It's like Moliere's bourgeois gentilhomme, Monsieur Jordan, who spoke prose without even realizing it, copyright vests, even if you don't even realize it. And the sheer volume of material that has become copyright protected across the globe since I started talking today is incalculable, is astronomical. Hundreds of millions, probably billions, of copyright protected works have been making their way across the net since I began this talk. If we could somehow see it, if we could actually visualize all that information all wrapped up in copyright and locked up as private property, I think we would have a better idea of how bloated this system has become. So we've reached a point where we protect pretty much everything for pretty much forever. Um, it's a potentially crushing burden for the global conversation to bear. If we could actually enforce this system of rights, if everyone who actually needed permission to do what he or she wanted to do tried to obtain that permission, the worldwide conversation would cease or it would dim considerably. And that would be a terrible shame and a terrible irony. Copyright, which is supposed to fuel the engine of creativity, um, and creative expression is now in serious danger of becoming one of the more serious impediments to that creative outpouring, an obstacle to be overcome in the pursuit of creative expression rather than facilitating and enabling uh, uh, the facilitating and enabling device that we want it to be. Which all brings me back to Creative Commons. The Creative Commons and open access movements have started their own global conversation about copyright and copyright law. Pushback, as it's called these days. And not, or not just, in the legislative halls, but as it were, in the trenches, where the action really is. Um, we are all better off for it, and long may it flourish.
Thank you very much.